some crap basket. All right, let's get back to some boring subjects. Understand the risk of our country. Freedom you brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle, and I am so glad to be here with you. If you are, um, well, tonight's red meat. We're going to pick on Elizabeth Warren and Medicare for All. And when we give you the details, you're just going to go, WTF. This is, this is a bigger fantasy than, uh, I mean, a voluntary society is more likely than this work. So that's the, it's just amazing. Socialists are always uh, coming up with new crazy ideas. And we'll discuss that right after this. Warning. This show is for adults, produced by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the program. We are discussing Medicare for All and Elizabeth Warren's plan uh, coming up. Uh, it's really unbelievable. You, <laughs> you know, every time you think that the Democrats can't come up with something crazier, they certainly have. Uh, but we'll... Uh, We'll treat it with dignity and respect on the other side of these introductions. I want to say uh, the, the man shaking his head, know that he will not, uh, is our good friend, Harry Price. Harry, how are you? You're going to have to, both of you are going to have to unmute if you want to talk in the program. Well, you know, I just want to make sure I didn't say something like inappropriate during the intro and other things, you know. I just, I let you stay home. Uh, I allow it, and then this is how you repay me with your unprofessionalism. See, he can't have a he can't have the button there. He also can't have it at home either. You take it away from him. Right. <laughs> that, that is Reinhold. Uh, Reinhold's back. Uh, Reinhold will be on. I have not told him this, but he's going to be on a little more often because he's very well informed. Um, uh, and we're also going to soon have the Empress of Meme on, so uh, stay yes. tuned for that. She's very, very, uh, very intelligent, and she runs the best Instagram page, Empress of Meme, like impressive meme, mm -hmm. but uh, E M P R E S S O F meme. Um, so, Harry, it is like 12 degrees outside. We had a freak, weird November snowstorm with like four inches of snow and ice last night here in Indianapolis. Normally, we don't get this kind of weather until well into January. It's been very temperate. I remember having snowy Thanksgivings as a kid, but not as an adult, really. Uh, so Harry was just beside himself. He couldn't go out in the weather, and his new contract says that if it is below 20 degrees, he gets to stay home. So, uh, so everybody's at Zoom, snug, nestled in their beds, and uh, here we are. We're we're all online. So Harry, uh, I hope you have some comfy shoes on. First off, fake news. The contract does say that I don't have to come out under twenty, but we'll come if all Chris has to do is turn the fireplace on. Okay. You to turn the fireplace on. Okay. Well, as you know, I use premium hardwood, which is five dollars uh, a. a for basically three logs at the local gas station. So that's a steep demand. So it's just cheaper to do it this way. <laughs> yeah, it was really, really freaking cold. Um, glad I upgraded to the uh, newer Subaru. It took it like a champ. <laughs> My car didn't even get warm till I got to work 20 minutes later. It was, <laughs> and I didn't have any washer fluid either. Mm. I'm basically like a college girl. I'm. I have no gas. I have no washer fluid. I haven't changed the oil in three thousand in, in like ten thousand miles. Like, I need someone to come take care of my car. <laughs> well, at least you get the new tires. Yes, I have the new tires. They're about a year old though. So, oh, did the yes. brakes get fixed? I have new brakes. I have new yes, tires. Oh, I almost good. forgot he never did those brakes. Oh yeah, that it's, sex is great. But have you ever had four new tires with new brakes? It's the best because you can drive like a maniac. Mm -hmm. have, but have you done new tires, new brakes with new suspension? 
No, no. I've yeah. never had a car that long. It usually blows up before I need suspension. <laughs> I wonder why if you don't change the oil every 10,000. <laughs> I'm curious, right? Uh, we're not going to belabor the point too much. We're going to kind of get right into it tonight because we have, um, a very information packed show. Okay. So I'm going to do a Dan Carlin preface. Here. So, you know, Dan's always good at kind of, uh, so on this one, here's what, how I want you to think about the show. So there is a proposal by Elizabeth Warren Basically, she put numbers to Medicare for all, which is basically socialized medicine in the United States. It's jam-packed full of information. We have notes, 16 pages long, thanks to Sam Schultz. They're unbelievably great notes. Uh, so you can kind of go check those out. There's all kinds of extra information that we just won't speak here on the program. You can check out kind of we, – when we do these kind of explainer shows where we give you the details of a news story, we really want to make sure that you – get the information you know from the sources what we're talking about and then we react to those sources we try to be journalistic in our approach in that we don't assume the story based on the ephemera of facebook statuses and twitter headlines we try to actually d dig deep and give you some research and make you sound smarter when you're talking about this stuff and give libertarian opinion on the news along the way now, sometimes in these explainer shows, it's very easy, like in the Kurds episode, where there's not a ton of notes. But when you have a plan that is going to basically reshape the entire economy and all of healthcare, and Elizabeth Warren puts it out and gives you specific details, there's a lot of information there. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this uh, as long as we're going to try and not bore you with it. Because there's a ton of details that I want to give you because I think they're important details that really highlight the overarching philosophy that both Elizabeth Warren is trying to push and the philosophy that we are trying to uh, push back with. So this may not be a terribly long episode tonight. We may do a part two. Uh, you know, if we go an hour and we're just exhausted with too many details, we'll, we'll just quit. And then come back and, and do a part two. But uh, I just wanted to make sure that you know, hey, there may be uh, in this episode, all of the information not may not be in this particular episode. We're actually talking about doing an entire healthcare series uh, around this, not just on this, but also what's the history of healthcare? That socialized medicine has been in the American political scene since Woodrow Wilson and, and his administration. Uh, a little bit before even, um, you know, the HMO Act, obviously you had Medicare and Medicaid being created under LBJ. You had the HMO Act under Nixon that was greatly impactful that very few people talk about. Um, and then also Obamacare. So we're going to do some history. We're going to talk about the, uh, the more in-depth on some of the proposals. And then we're going to give you some libertarian alternatives to some of this stuff. Um, but by criticizing her plan, we're hopefully going to get you to think differently about healthcare, which is incredibly important. Now, all of this work is funded by our patrons. And so if you are a fan of We Are Libertarians or if you learned something from this show, then you can thank all of our patrons. You can find out more at wearelibertarians.com. But we especially want to thank our $100 a month contributors, starting with Craig DaCosta, who I saw was in Boston recently, one of my favorite towns. I think it was Boston. Uh, somewhere on the East Coast. I was jealous that where he was and where I, wa where I was not. Uh, Christy Avery, probably watching in the hot tub right now. Uh, Jason Doolittle, Jeff Bennett, Matthew Durbin, and Ed Brehob. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for supporting our work. And we are always looking for more people to help support our work, especially as we head into election season. Um, so uh, I don't know about you two. I'm not sure if you two are experts on uh, <laughs> socialized medicine. I have feel like I have damn near become an expert after these past uh, few days of research. But uh, Medicare for All is basically the single payer healthcare system that has really Bernie Sanders began pushing and has kind of articulated support for it the most. And then Elizabeth Warren signed on and said that she was a fan of it. And uh, Bernie Sanders has given some details, and Elizabeth Warren gave no details. And so she's the candidate who is 
constantly saying, I have a plan for that. And this was the one thing she didn't have a plan for. And so she's like, so the Sanders campaign and his supporters, especially the supporters in the media, kept pushing her to give details on her Medicare for all plan. And so she did something incredibly stunning, brave, and stupid all at the same time and gave not just some details, but uh, several pages of a plan, a full funding uh, mechanism for all of this. She ascribed actual numbers to it. The total cost of her transition is $52 trillion. Uh, now she says, well, you know, we sp in the next 10 years, Americans will spend $52 trillion on healthcare. And so we're just swapping that out for Medicare for all, as opposed to just whatever system we have now. Uh, now, <laughs> it's, it seems so simple. Like it just, you go, Harry, uh, we're just going to switch it, right? We're just going to flip it, okay? So instead of it being a private sector, private, quasi private public sector healthcare system that we have now, we're just going to flip it and it's going to be all public. It'll be 52 trillion. Uh, even though the Urban Institute says it would cost $59 trillion. She just managed to find in $7 trillion in savings just by cutting waste, which, which anytime you hear a couple trillion, waste, yeah, which is, yeah, yeah. Seven magical, trillion. yeah, but you find $7 trillion in the magical. Elizabeth Warren is going to just flip it. It's, it's that easy, right? Mm hmm So yeah. it's not. <laughs> flip it, do some magic, put some spin on it, you know, because you're going to spend this money anyways. Yes, yeah, right. We're going to spend it for you. Yes. In ways that we deem fit. The, that is the stunning, that is the, that is the key part of it. The way that Elizabeth Warren sees fit. The overconfidence in this plan and the stunning lack of understanding of basic economics and just bullshit, frankly, mm -hmm. uh, that we're about to lay out is frightening. It is stupid. It is intelligently dumb i don't know I, I i just think you're going to be impressed with someone who has no awareness of how the real world works no awareness of incentives for the average person mm -hmm. but just thinks that she alone by sheer wheel of force can reshape 20 percent of the economy with no ill effects whatsoever everybody will just go yeah good idea now that i've read this let's completely change the economy and human will just yeah. will just the way humans work you know, we'll, yeah. that'll get changed too. Yeah. So, um, so, so Elizabeth Warren has a plan for healthcare, <laughs> and that's kind of what we're going to go through. But I want to spend some time on Elizabeth Warren because I think Elizabeth Warren is a sincere, intelligent person who is doing the right thing by trying to tell people what she's going to do in detail. And I think as a citizen who votes, a citizen who just cares, a citizen who wants to understand what our elected leadership might do, considering they have the force of government, meaning they have a gun and you don't, um, I want to understand exactly what they will do, not just sort of the vague promises. And so I find it admirable and to be applauded that Elizabeth Warren would take a step that put out specific plans for something that costs $52 trillion. I'm not being, I'm not being sarcastic at all. I think it, I wish more candidates would do that, but they don't because she's getting absolutely slaughtered over this because it's so crazy pants. Um, and so Bernie Sanders rightly just says, well, we're going to do it. We're going to change the economy. We're going to make the rich pay for it. Uh, and everybody goes, yay. But then when you actually get into the details of what Congress might work through, uh, it's just not that simple. So I do applaud her for having the guts to put her neck on the line when she's a potential front runner and put out something so specific because I really do think in the day and age of the websites with four bullet points, and that's the extent of their plans for America, it is courageous that she took, took a step. Do you or do you not agree with me on this? <clears throat> Anyone? You, I'm, am I here alone? I thought Harry was taking that one, but I, I thought Ryan was taking that one. No, 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 no. I, I find her, um, I mean, she felt, I think she was pressured into it. I don't think she wanted to do this, but 
she still did it. So good for her. I mean, the whole point of having the election is to find out what everybody stands for so that we can make the right choice in, in president. So yeah. coming out on the record and saying, this is what I want to do, knowing she's going to get killed for it. Um, I mean, that's brave, right? Yeah. Cause so even... many, so many politicians are just like, eh, you know, we'll work those details out. And as long as we have the right vision, we'll get there and everything else. And they never really get into the details. I just don't think, I don't think she thought she was going to get killed for this. I literally think this is her plan. This is how she did everything. This is how she got, you know, she got in the office. Just like I put my plan down the paper. I executed. This I do think there's do. some truth to that. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I'll just get the typical conservatives who just don't like me, but, uh, uh, but she has, you know, Joe Biden has criticized her. Bernie Sanders has criticized her saying that it's bad for jobs. When Bernie Sanders says something is as bad for jobs, she's been criticized by the New York Times. She's been criticized by many people on the left. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, I would count them in sort of the usual players, but like the, you know, you know, you know National Review is going to write a column yeah, against yeah. it, right? Like there's no surprise when they do it. It's more surprising when your rivals actually. The, the problem, I think, for most Democrats running for president right now, specifically Elizabeth Warren, is you, you don't get – when you get pushback and in, in very serious ways as conservatives and libertarians often do in the public sphere from the mainstream media, it makes you sharpen your arguments more. And Elizabeth Warren is so beloved by most of the people in the chattering class and the Voxes of the world and the New York times and, and the Washington post that she doesn't get a lot of pushback. So I don't know that they've necessarily as a campaign known what to do with criticism from usually fairly consistent allies so yeah, I mean, go ahead harry think, go ahead all right so the like but, but my thing with warren is just like uh, she, she sees that but she is such a just a i'm sorry like the typical new englander you know this is you know i know better than everyone else in the other piece a piece of crap states that's not new england this is our plan this is what we're gonna do you all suck mm-hmm and they don't care. It's like, and the price doesn't matter to them because it's like, no, yeah, we're going to pay that. We're going right. to pay that. This is what we're going to do. Be- because that's what they freaking do in Massachusetts. No, no, no. This is what we're going to do. The big, dig is gonna co- the big dig is going to cost billions of dollars. So we're going to dig a hole in the ocean. That's what we're doing. Dennis? Well, it's also a, um, and I got sidetracked. Um, <laughs> sorry. But I think to her, it seems like a big vision thing to, you know, like Kennedy say, we're going to put a man on the moon. We're going to fix this and this. Don't, we're not going to worry about the cost. We're going to worry about what's right and do this big thing because we can because we're right. Americans. So we were able to do that. But the details and what they're the problem is they don't understand the problems that are the the healthcare system. And because they don't understand that they don't have the right fix for it. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right. So I think that's where the real problem comes in on, on this, where she thinks she's doing the right thing because her ideology tells her this is the right thing. But until you understand the reasons why it won't work or the reasons why a current have doesn't work, you're never going to get a successful uh, result. Yeah. Yeah. I know the reasons why the Medicare system hasn't been expanded upon. Why haven't anyone opened this program up? Why? You know, or why has it sit this very small or why don't people like being on to it? Why is there Medicaid assistance or there, why is there holes in Medicaid and why do people like to get insurance because of the holes in it? You've ever mm-hmm. asked yourself that question. You know, why don't people, you know, if Medicaid is such a shining jewel of everything, then people be ecstatic about it. So they're like, man, I've got this. <laughs> and people don't want to be on Medicare, Medicaid. They want to be on private insurance by and large. Mm-hmm. And make no mistake that this would absolutely end the private insurance market. The private insurance market, the people, people scapegoat health insurance companies and drug companies and medical providers and doctors and all that. What people hate are the high costs. Mm-hmm. But what people don't understand is the high costs are caused by government intervention and regulation. And so, you know, just look at look at basic principles of insurance. Insurance is essentially a you you pay into a pool of money, mm-hmm. and everybody pays into it. Uh, maybe not at the exact same rate, but an insurance provider will essentially 
uh, look at you and your history and your medical background uh, and, and say, you know, your risk is higher for diabetes. So therefore you must pay more. You know, my family has heart disease and I'm overweight, whereas Harry is in shape and the same age. So Harry, because he takes better care of himself or medically on paper, it looks like he takes better care of himself. How dare you. Insurance companies. Hey, I'm going to orange theory and working my butt off. Okay. So I'm not saying I'm unhealthy, uh, but on paper, you look like a much safer risk than me. Now, overarching black men have a higher risk of heart disease and diabetes. Okay. So that factors in, um, but you and I are the same age. You're of a healthy weight. I'm of a non-healthy weight. So you'd pay into the pool a little less than I would. Now, Dennis is significantly older than both of us. Many, many, many decades older than Harry and I. Uh, I'm just kidding, Reinhold. Uh, no, but, you're actually true. <laughs> but uh, he, because he is older, he would pay more than I would pay. So uh, a health insurance market essentially functions that way. So uh, it, it's based on where you live. It's based on many different factors. If you want to know more, watch about Schmidt, the great movie with Jack Nicholson. And it, it explains insurance to you very well. And as the, um, as the government moves in, now, now, basically, you take from the pool when you need resources from the pool, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, a, a, the, the markets kind of function based on, on need and risk, and, and it just kind of – I don't know how to describe a market without seeming cliche, I guess, uh, because what the left has done such a good job of is making all, a lot of our arguments sound cliche, but – what happens is there's risk, right? So there's risk to the company in insuring you. What happens with a government-backed market, as we've seen with student loans, is that there's really no risk. There is uh, – you take out of the pool what you need to, and then we'll find the money from somewhere, usually just by inflating the currency through printing money at the Federal Reserve. So the problem is that – if you have a public, if you have a public option, or worse, you have a, a Medicare for all single payer system, then there is no price competition because there is no risk. You will just have many, many more users using things, and there is no you. You have to be covered. It's not even a choice. You're covered, and so there's no risk to the government. They just pay. They find a way to pay for it. And so cost just massively spirals out of control. And the problem is that when, when you set up systems as they're trying to set up and they have set up where a lot of the government single pay, the government public option plans are paid for by private insurance markets or private taxpayers you have, or, or through taxes on corporations or wealthy individuals, the, those people start canceling their private plans and put more people onto the public option and so, therefore, the private markets just sort of atrophy very quickly. They run out of resources to function because you've redistributed the wealth from the private plans to the public plans. Did I make sense with all of that? Was I clear enough, do you think? Yeah, I think you were clear. Okay. And, and there's some stuff to add to that, too, because one of the problems with doing this type of solution, right, to, to, the, to the problem, the healthcare problem, is that you're, you're paying into the pool. You're usually paying in the pool based off your risk. So if you, choose, you know, some of the, some of that risk is stuff that you can't do anything about, but some of that risk is stuff that you can do stuff about, whether you're overweight, whether you eat a, uh, the right types of foods, you keep a healthy lifestyle, you work out, that sort of thing. Uh, choosing to smoke or not to smoke, those types of things. So that determines how much you pay in. When you get into a program like this, a government program, everybody, everybody pays in based off of some other determination factor, right? So mm -hmm. uh, you start getting, you start getting politics involved in the prop into the, into the system. And when you get politics involved in the system, you're going to end up with, well, the poorer people shouldn't pay as much as the rich people because rich people can afford it. And therefore it doesn't matter what lifestyle you choose. You're going to be taken care of and somebody else is end up paying for it. Right. And, and that's where the moral hazard gets pulled away. Pulled, it removes right, all incentive pulled, yeah. for you to be a responsible consumer because you have no fiduciary interest in making sure that you take care of yourself because somebody correct. else will pay for it. 
Correct. And that's why like people will take these ridiculous uh, majors in college because meh, whatever. So right. I'm going to pay for it. You know, it's it, it, the, you exported the risk and you moved it down the line to make other people pay for it. it it's it's what the United States government's very good at. The other thing is blowing things up. But yeah, just yeah. look at our debt. That's, you know, I'm a, our kids and grandkids will be paying for that for a yeah. good time that we're paying for right now that we're experiencing right now that's going to be paid for by somebody else correct yes, yeah. and all right great time that we're all so here. horrible all right so this is technically close to what we're doing too but this one thing i have a, this question is i need ryan holding it <laughs> right because in my lifetime i've watched the national debt just grow crazy right and I remember did, I did a podcast of talking about how crazy the number a trillion is, like how crazy, ridiculous, you don't really understand what a trillion really looks like. Mm-hmm. And now we're just throwing the word trillion around like it's nothing. Yeah. Fit, we're, we're almost talking a hundred trillion. You know, we're talking $59 trillion. Do you, you guys realize how much that money that is? You know, it's just crazy. <laughs> you know, last year, the, the GDP increased $1 trillion and our debt increased $1.3 trillion. Now, anybody can do the math on that and find out how we're doing well as an economy right now, supposedly. Mm-hmm. It's because we're just borrowing the money and putting it into the system. You it, just you can't, can't let Trump that. win, can you? You just got to shit on <laughs> this. Was, no, this isn't Trump, though. This has been going on for tw- uh, years and years. Obama did the same thing. We're just, we're just continuing Obama's policies right now. I mean, that's, that's the reality of it. But, right. Know, which is a continuation of Bush's policies. What but, but when you get into the, the health care specifically, too, and when we talk about how health care costs are skyrocketing and so high, what people don't understand is that most of that is smoke and mirrors. Mm-hmm. Right? So the insurance company wants you to think that they're doing you a service. They're doing you a great job. Now, the reality is that most people who pay into private insurance is getting screwed. There is no way they're going to make a profit. And, and the profits that insurance companies make usually aren't that high. They're like two, 3%. They're not, you know, 50% profit and all sorts of stuff. So they're not, they're not making bank. They're making it in volume. Right. But mm-hmm. what they do is they say, you know, all, all these people paying in, you're paying in how much you think, you know, for your, just to be covered. Most people don't use that much. Right. If they had put it in a savings account, they could have paid out of pocket for what the actual cost of that service was. And come out on the better end, but it doesn't look that way because on paper, what the insurance company does then is say, we're only going to pay X amount for this procedure. And the doctors realize, Hey, I'm only going to get X amount for this procedure because they're going to knock off 65% or 70%. So we'll raise our rates up to make it, you know, to make it. So when they cut that, we're still getting paid enough for us to make a profit. And then the insurance company and then to go back and forth and they come to an agreement on what a good inflated number is Mm -hmm. so that they both look like they're doing something valuable. And the consumer ends up seeing this bill that says, Oh, $10,000 for an aspirin and all sorts of stuff. But look, if you look real close, the insurance only pays a fraction of that. And they say negotiated price and the price is less. So they're really not paying that much. You're, everybody's getting scanned into thinking they're making the, the good financial decision, having that insurance for everyday needs. Mm-hmm. When the reality is most people should just have, just pay doctors what they need to pay for basic stuff, going to the doctor, you know, annual checkups, that sort of thing. And when you get into catastrophic care is when you get into the actually lower cost insurance for catastrophic care that people would pay into just to cover for, you know, heart attacks and, uh, un, unknown things, diseases you didn't know, like cancer and things like that coming around. So that that's really the best way to solve that problem. But nobody sees that problem because they're all mesmerized by these huge numbers and we have to do something and and then they get politics involved into it and, and just kind of keep a blind eye to it. Yeah, the insurance companies are really, in a lot of ways, the villains. That, like, I, I don't know how much I can say. I probably shouldn't say much, but... The, the reality is that with drug prices, for instance, it's the insurance companies doing the math and they're basically taking highly discounted drugs from drug companies. So they beat down the drug companies to give them highly discounted drugs. And then they beat down the distributors, mm-hmm. a, AKA pharmacies and doctors to, to give, uh, to, they, they make up their money by basically 
overcharging the public for a lot of these drug prices and drug companies take a lot of the hit. Um, it's, it's insurance companies that really kind of keep things uh, inflated. Wish I could, I, I have to talk to my, my sources to make sure that I can tell you kind of more <laughs> on that. But just know the Chris Spangle guarantee, it's the insurance companies that you should hate. And Not the funny the, thing is, is that right. we, we could talk about the insurance companies being the evil, but the reason why the insurance companies are as powerful as they are now is because of government when this whole thing ramped up back in the yep. uh, 30s when they did price freezing for, for uh, uh, salaries. So the FDR, they said, okay, we're going to freeze everybody's prices, nobody, everybody's salaries, so nobody can get paid more. Well, companies wanted to have you know, they're, they want to go still get the better people and entice them some way. So they said, Hey, we'll just start paying for your, uh, we'll just buy you health insurance and you don't have to pay anything and we'll take care of it for you. And that's how businesses got into the insurance game because they weren't doing that before. Um, and it just became the industry at the time to where they got their foot in the door and it wasn't going anywhere after that. Uh, everybody expects that from the companies. Right. Okay. So let yeah, it's a benefit that you expect. Yeah. Or like to go touch on point, then we can go on. But to touch on the point that the other thing, the other way the insurance company make money off of people is very predatorial, awful. They make money off of also young, healthy men. A lot of yeah. men purchase health insurance and they never go take a yearly checkup. Yeah. They just do not and will not until something's drastically wrong with them in their forties. But they've been paying for health insurance up until their forties. Every, yeah. every every month, send that check in and never do anything with it. It's just like, nope, that's what my job has. And then, then when they get a spouse, they pay for their health insurance, they pay for their spouse's health insurance, and they still do not go to the doctor. All right, so let's jump into some of the details of what Elizabeth Warren has put into her report. Our source is basically the report. Uh, and, and details from that. Again, show notes are found at wearelibertarians.com in the show notes section of your podcast app or on the website. Thank you to Sam for the great notes. Uh, so she starts out the whole plan. And I, if I might give some unsolicited advice to Elizabeth Warren that she will never hear, uh, maybe you should stop with the personal stories. She starts the plan. You know, my papa had a heart attack and it nearly bankrupted the family and we almost lost the farm. And it's like, you are the least credible candidate in the race competing with Donald Trump for the most dishonest about family stories and personal histories. And, you know, I'm going to avoid using Pocahontas despite thinking it's the funniest thing that Donald Trump has ever said. Uh, maybe you shouldn't, but this has been, she just can't, she thinks her personal story really helps. And it's just like, dude, nobody believes you anymore. You weren't pregnant when you got fired or whatever that whole thing was. You, she just, she's full of crap. She's such a politician, but she appears like just, just your regular soccer mom out there who uh, is a professor. And I don't know, she has something where she seems credible. She feels like she's credible and she's just lies through her teeth about so much stuff. Um, but I, I really think that Elizabeth Warren is a dangerous combination of like Wilsonian idealism, overconfidence, and just ignorance of basic economics, as you'll kind of see. Um, so she starts out a story talking of, you know, personal story, and this is why I want to do this. And, uh, you know, we, we had troubles and many, many people have a lot of problems with their health care. And they kind of give you the same thing where people are eating dog food or paying for their health care, which... I don't know about you guys, but the, the several 10, 12, 13,000 people listening, I bet not. I, I, there, there are situations where uh, prescription drug prices, for instance, our friend Phyllis, who I know is watching, hello to Phyllis, pays an outrageous amount of money for her, for her cancer treatment drugs. And we did a, a cost episode that I'll put in the show notes about it. Um, but you know, so there are legitimate problems, but they tr always trot out, you know, grandma's eating dog food and, uh, instead of because uh, she's paying for medicine, that sort of thing. Um, so lowering the cost of prescription drugs is kind of the first pillar of her plan. And so under her Affordable Drug Manufacturing Act, she's going to allow the Department of Human Health and Services to step in where the market has failed. 
All right. So you guys are going to have to hop in because we're going to do a lot of reading till the end of this episode through these details. But this is a, a recurring theme through this plan. The market has failed. So I need to intervene into uh, this situation with the government. Uh, she basically would give the ability of HHS to manufacture generic drugs in cases in which no company is manufacturing a drug, when only one or two companies manufacture a drug and its price has spiked, when the drug is in shortage, or when a medicine listed as essential by the World Health Organization faces limited competition and high prices. Uh, now, would either of you take a drug manufactured by the government? Of course, I trust them. Other than uh, Soma. I, I trust them um, completely. Um, they make sure my water is clean to drink. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I can trust in that. Roads are well paved. Yeah, well, roads, well paved. Is DMV are short. Oh, yeah, DMV lines. I can do it all digital. Peace is flourished throughout the earth. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> another part of it is, uh, are you going to say something more or are we going to continue joking? Oh, no, you can go, <laughs> Uh, another part of it is the me uh, mental health uh, part. She would add the CARE Act, the C-A-R-E Act. It would invest $100 billion in federal funding over the next 10 years in states and communities to fight the mental health crisis. It gives Red flag law, gun confiscation in the back door. It so. gives directly to first responders, public health departments, and communities on the front lines of this crisis so that they have the resources to provide prevention, treatment, and recovery services for those who need it most. I've heard this before. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, that was the education system. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the, it would invest $100 billion over 10 years. And then it would just, they wouldn't keep that money flowing into local communities and they wouldn't be crippling, de cripplingly dependent on federal funding, would they? Right. Well, and also you get to the point where they say, well, we're giving you this money. We have some conditions now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you need and to do this and you need to do it this way and the way we say. And Here's where you're a small thinker, unlike Elizabeth Warren. Education is so much better than the 1970s when the DOE was created. So yeah, because test scores, you can see the graph, and I, mm. I don't know. To me, it seems like it's going in the opposite direction we want it to. But well, again, who, that's just who am I? Right. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm just a person sharing. who's it's a person who's racist. red facts, right? Yeah, it's yeah just you're racist. right. It's racist. Ra racist Reinhold. It also works to strengthen our addiction treatment infrastructure, expanding access to medication-assisted treatment and ensuring treatment programs and recovery residences. That they meet high standards. The government loves to impose standards and fines and never, uh, they love to tell you what you have to do through mandates and then never fund those. And Elizabeth's plan would help hold drug manufacturers accountable for pushing powerful and addictive drugs that contribute to the epidemic, the opioid act. Um, now, they help create, which the government <laughs> help create, right? So, protecting <laughs> access to health care in rural communities. Medicare for all will mean access to primary care and lower health costs for patients and less uncompensated care for rural hospitals, helping them stay afloat. Elizabeth will create a new Medicare designation for rural hospitals that reimburses them at a higher rate and offers flexibility of services to meet the needs of their communities. Elizabeth will also strengthen antitrust protections to fight hospital mergers that increase costs, lower quality, and close rural facilities. Um, now, we're kind of seeing, there was an article in the Indy Star recently that uh, Cass County, which is the, I think the least populated county in the state of Indiana out of 92, mm -hmm. uh, had 15 players on their football team and they're gonna shut down the only football team in the county because they just don't have enough kids going to the school to justify the cost of a football team. So what you're seeing in rural communities is that people in the millennial and generation Z uh, and presumably whatever comes after that are moving out of these rural communities and they're not replacing that population. And so healthcare, if you have a market-based system, uh, they're not able to keep up and keep the best doctors. And, you know, and that's, that's pretty typical in a state like Indiana. People who are from an hour or two north or south typically come to Indianapolis to go to Methodist or IU or, um, well, not Wishard, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, or St. Francis or St. Vincent's. Um, but so, you know, I, I, if you can travel to a specialist in, in a, a bigger city i don't know why it's important to force revenue into places you know you obviously need good emergency technicians but why force 
specialists and, and funding into rural areas when they're not really needed because of population. Because most of the people who live out in those communities are going to be left after eventually is just going to be the ultra wealthy who have their just country houses. Like I said, this is New England thinking. This is yeah. this is like, oh yeah, I've got a house in Boston, but yeah, I'm going to go up to the vineyard. Jackson Jackson Hole is owned. Jackson Hole, Wyoming's owned by basically Kanye West and David Letterman now. So, yeah, but think about that. You put this hospital there with few people, and then you've got to staff that so you have to hire people so people move into the, it could revitalize that whole county right uh, <laughs> with the spreading, just federal funds that are taken from somewhere and then right yeah jobs program obviously where public oh. money flows job creation flows after it oh yes yeah it's very simple simple economics if you don't understand sarcasm this is a very difficult episode we're oh, yeah, this is this is gonna be good uh, so Elizabeth's plan will increase funding for community health centers by 15% per year over five years and establish a $25 billion capital fund to support a menu of options for improving access to care and health professional shortage areas. She will grow the current health workforce in rural communities by lifting the cap on medical residency placements, targeting in underserved areas by 15,000 over the next five years and increasing the National Health Service Corps and the... Indian Health Service uh, loan repayment programs, I had to hold back the Pocahontas jokes, to full loan repayment. <laughs> and her plan will invest in the future health workforce by dramatically scaling up apprenticeship programs between unions, high schools, community colleges, and a wide array of healthcare professionals to build a healthcare workforce that is rooted in the community. Translation, we're going to staff up uh, workforce by recruiting a lot of inexperienced people because we know there's going to be a massive shortage, <laughs> even more than there already is thanks to Obamacare. Well, and by the way, for the for the Pocahontas thing, just to kind of give some background, that should be credited to the people who came up with it first, which was uh, no agenda. <laughs> they were saying it three years before Trump was. Yeah, I mean, she's. Elizabeth Warren is the type of politician who gets made fun of. She, I, we've done an episode on it. I'll see if I can find it in the show notes. I'll put in the link in there because Harry and I have covered it. Uh, but basically, she said she was Native American on a form to help get her hired at Harvard. And she, you know, she has a very common, like in my family, we, we've always been told we're 1 16th Choctaw and Cherokee. Yeah. Like my great great grandmother was full blooded Indian. And like, the, the genetic test that my sister took does not bear that out whatsoever. Like she has a very common American story where someone in your family three generations ago told some bullshit, uh, you know? And so I get that, but like at the same time, like don't double down and add your family chili recipe to powwow chow and run on office for on it. And, you know, and then, and then release that you're one twenty twenty fourth, like one, over 2,024th Native American, like the memes were so sad. Yeah, the one over 124 me zero one zero two four memes. I've made a few myself. It was, oh. <laughs> it was the funniest day of memes in yeah. a long time. I mean, it was brilliant. I mean, I kind of feel for her a little bit, but she put brings it on herself, right? So I mean, had, don't make that your identity. Make your you your identity. I never understood this with people. It's like you're you. She leads Not, with her chin. Like she yeah. doesn't need to. Like, she didn't need to put out that, you know, she's 120, you know, I don't know, man. 48 uh, something. Right. Yeah. Uh, so but, yeah, she, it's not necessary. So she kind of starts with some of her broader principles in the plan. All my plans start with our shared values. There are two absolute non negotiables when it comes to health care. One, no American should ever die or go bankrupt because of health care costs. No more GoFundMe campaigns to pay for care. No more rationing insulin. No more choosing between medicine and groceries. I think every single person hearing this totally agrees that that should be the guiding principle of what we ought to uh, aspire to see in our healthcare system. You know, nobody should have to go bankrupt because they're trying to get themselves well. I understand that, but like, if but GoFundMe is just a community charity arm. What's wrong with charity? Well, charity giving out charity's charity. horrible. Char charity's oh, bad. Sorry. Because, oh. And the reason why charity is bad to people like elizabeth warren is because charity gives people the choice yeah. on whether or not to help somebody or not and you're not smart enough to make that choice and and you're 
going to be selfish and keep that money for yourself. So we need to make sure that you contribute just like everybody else does. Despite like the, we mentioned Methodist hospital, which is the hospital that saved my grandfather's life. I've, I think I've maybe said this on the oh, show. He lost recently. It. Yeah. You know, he, I mean, Reinhold had an experience where Methodist, it's an amazing hospital. You know why mm-hmm. it's called Methodist? Because the Methodists mm-hmm. in this town in the 19th century saw a need and pooled their money, the wealthy in Indianapolis pooled their money and built Methodist hospital. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, the reality is that the 19th century model of insurance was effectively charity. It was <laughs> people who saw a need. You see that same impulse in somebody like Bill Gates, who is worth $58, $60 billion. He's given away $39 billion. And this plan would tax him $9 billion. And, and liberal journalists were, the, the Lib Joes, as our friends on No Agenda say, were picking on Bill Gates saying, you know, he's so selfish that he doesn't yeah. want to give $9 billion to help pay for health care in America. Well, no, he doesn't want to give $9 billion to the government, which is completely corrupt and ineffective. He wants to give $9 billion to the direct partners that he works with that have had a verifiable, incredible impact on food and health in Africa, for instance. Mm-hmm. So it, the, the impulse for people who make a tremendous amount of money to go, I have too much, what can I do to help change the lives of others is still there, but they don't trust it because a politician like Elizabeth Warren, as you will see, can't control it. And that's what pisses her off. I mean, look at the, every year we hear about an audit with, for the uh, Pentagon and they find out that there's a few trillion dollars that we just can't really account for. Not that they necessarily wasted it or, or went to CIA special black ops or anything, just kind of yeah. don't know what happened. It's just, it's somewhere. right. So when you hear $7 trillion will be saved in Elizabeth Warren's plan by cost savings and effective streamlining, like, okay. All right. Uh, it's so the, the, right, the second shared value, every American should be able to see the doctors they need and get their recommended treatments without having to figure out who is in network. Oh, what a hardship. No for-profit insurance company should be able to stop anyone from seeing the expert or getting the treatment they need. Now, her plan fundamentally fails this second tenant. Uh, it, it fails on both of these accounts. At, at the end of this, we'll kind of revisit this again, but the fact is, is that your doctor will probably quit practicing medicine and you will not have the opportunity to have them replaced because the ability to make money, aka repay their massive student loans, will no longer be there as we'll see over the course of this plan. So she will fail her own test by the end of these episodes. So under my plan, Medicare for All will cover the full list of benefits outlined in the Medicare for All Act, including long-term care, audio, vision, dental, and mental health benefits. My plan covers every single person in the United States and includes common sense payment reforms that makes Medicare for All possible without spending any more overall than we spend now. So she outlined some options that we have. Maintain our current system, which will cost the country $52 trillion over 10 years, And under the current system, 24 million people won't have coverage and millions can't get long-term care. 63 million have coverage gaps or substandard coverage that could break down if they actually get sick. Together, the American people will pay 11 trillion of that bill themselves in the form of premiums, deductibles, co-pays, out of network, and other expensive medical equipment and care they pay for out of pocket, all while America's wealthiest individuals and biggest companies pay far less in taxes than in other major company countries. Here it is. Okay, this is some Rob- <laughs> this is some Robespierre bullshit here. <laughs> so, the the problem with this is that that fifty two trillion over ten years is not public spending. That fifty two trillion dollars is the totality of all healthcare sp- expenditures. So, a person who, like my mother, who is a registered nurse. Uh, she does not work for the government. I'm sure part of her salary may come from Medicare or Medicaid re- reimbursements through her local community hospital that she works for. But she works for a private employer. She is not taking wealth out of the economy because she's living off of tax dollars. She's living off of income generated through private enterprise, private market forces. And so she is not a drag on the economy. 
that eleven trillion dollars is people like my mother. It is the doctor that you see. Is the it is the dentist that you go to. It is the hospital that you see. It, all of these jobs she has just assumed are a tax on all of Americans. She basically is making an option one here, the leap that any if you have to pay anything regarding your medical care, it is a tax on your life, which is fundamentally stupid because that's not how it works. A tax is something that you don't voluntarily pay. And, and so they typically try to force the argument that that uh, health care is a right, which we'll deal with in a moment. But it isn't because you have so much choice. You can go to the doctor or not go to the doctor. Nobody's compelling you to, but you can't avoid paying your taxes. So paying for the dentist is not a tax. So to treat out of network payments and premiums and deductibles as if it is some sort of tax, it is actually a tax now because you're compelled to have health insurance thanks to Barack Obama, but it wasn't before. You're so welcome. It's, sort of, it's sort of just disingenuous to just treat in the in it's a very sneaky turn of phrase that she's trying to present there but we here we are libertarians are too smart to fall for her uh her bs well and the other thing too in that 52 trillion that she wants to keep spouting is that a third of that is most likely the cost associated with having to enforce all of the uh, insurance junk right so like two out of five days of your doctor's day is spent doing paperwork and filling out forms and fighting with insurance companies and everything else. And they're not looking at, Oh, if we were to get rid of that part of it, we would cut costs significantly. No, they want to add more enforcement, more cost onto it uh, to make sure it happens. Cause that's the one thing in here that I'm sure they don't talk about is enforcement of this. Oh no, no, no. She's pretty clear about how she's going to enforce it. And it's some gangster shit. What's the Murray Rothbard quote? You know, I'll have to find the gangster quote by Murray Rothbard, but it, it suits it perfectly. It's really stunning. Uh, so option two, switch to my approach to Medicare for all, which would cost the country just under $52 trillion in t over 10 years. Now, we all know that government projections are always accurate. Uh, and there is no mission creep within government agencies. So like Social Security didn't start out just to help widowers and orphans. It now covers all Americans, for instance. Uh, and is massively Medicare and Medicaid were scored at some like m few million dollars and it, it's billion, it would cost billions or something. Um, now under this new system, every person in America, all 331 million people will have full health coverage and coverage for long-term care, whether you like it or not. Everybody gets the doctors and the treatments they need, whether you like it or not, when they need them and you're going to need them because you're going to be poor and starving. <laughs> no more restrictive <laughs> provider networks. No more insurance. All right. She keeps bringing up the provider networks. This must be tested and pulled because for me, I just go to my insurance website and find the doctor. I have Anthem. Everybody has Anthem, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, right? Like right. You, I, I've never had the, I've never not been able to go to my doctor since I was a teenager. Like I've, I've been on several different insurance plans, including 10 years of my life with no insurance. Uh, in my 20s like i've never i've never been denied like she just really is hammering this network thing and this must be just pull like people just must be really pissed off about this um, but i've never had an issue with it like when i found my therapist i just went to anthem's website and found the doctor i needed um so there are occasions where you can see a doctor or like you've known him for years and it's just not in your network. It's, it's right. rare in some, in, in here in Indiana, cause technically Indiana is still technically a small area, but if you're like a larger town, it's probably a little bit more competitive. So in this an is, area like Boston and I Massachusetts, don't know about your, I don't know about your grandparents, but my grandparents are like, we like Dr. Sheely and we'll only go to Dr. Sheely. And I don't care what the government and Medicaid says. We're going to Dr. Sheely. Like, yeah, yeah. You yeah. get old people. Um, yeah. Okay, boomer. Okay. Everybody gets the doctors and treatments they need. No more uh, restrictive provider networks. No more insurance companies denying coverage per for prescribed treatments, and no more going broke over medical bills. Uh, <laughs> you'll just bankrupt the whole country. Uh, the eleven yeah. trillion. I'm trying so hard to keep it in, but I just this is a libertarian podcast talking about socialized medicine. What if you expected fair and balanced? You're the idiot. Um, the, the 11 trillion in household insurance, 
and out-of-pocket expenses projected under our current system goes right back into the pockets of America's working people. And we make up the difference with targeted spending cuts, new taxes on giant corporations and the richest 1% of Americans, and by cracking down on tax evasion and fraud. Not one penny in middle class taxes it will increase. Uh, that, I, I, that is an absolute fantasy, as we will see probably in next week's episode. Are, aren't these same Democrats the one who are touting the fact that the tariffs that Trump has applied onto China are a tax <laughs> that we pay? Do they not make this connection, which is true? Don't get me wrong, but it, the same thing applies here. Well, the crazy part is, as we'll touch on this later, what they're basically going to do is they're going to they're not, it's not called a tax and she's claiming it's not a tax it's a contribution so like for instance the way that most insurance works after i believe the hmo act in the in the 70s under nixon uh it's employer based where if you took everybody off of the employer based insurance like for instance i work for a company i have no idea the numbers so i'm going to make it up Let's say the 20 people I work with are on one plan through my boss. Mm -hmm. You let go of those 20 people, you get rid of insurance and based employer and based insurance. Those 20 people become consumers and start shopping for individual plans. Well, right now your employer basically pays your insurance. Most of you, if you have employer based insurance, let's say you get a salary of $50,000, but you, you get full benefits you're costing your employer 90 to a hundred thousand dollars, maybe depending on how much they contribute to all those different benefits packages. You, what you make in your annual salary is not what you cost your employer. And so what she wants to do is something called an employer contribution, not a tax. Uh, but she wants to basically create another tax on businesses over 50 yeah. employees it's where another they, cost to the business for hiring you right so instead of you getting let's say you in that example you cost uh you get fifty thousand dollars and your insurance and your insurance and benefits cost your employer 30 instead of them not having to pay that 30 and you getting a majority of that money probably in your paycheck mm -hmm. that 30 mil that thirty thousand dollars is now going to be taxed and sent to the government for your health insurance program so, and this is just the early estimates. This is just a projection. So what your employer is probably going to end up having to pay is going to be far, far greater. And so it probably will end up costing you some of that $50,000 in salary because they're going to start taxing. And what they will do is it's basically a headcount tax. And so if, if you were a company that was responsible and nice and provided insurance for your employees, you're going to pay those taxes. If you were not doing that like Walmart, you're not going to pay those taxes. So you, you've now incentivized people to, in the year or two before this passes, completely cancel all plans and flood the public market so companies won't have to pay those new taxes. Or you're going to incentivize corporations to set up a bunch of shell corporations that then pay for insurance so they're not taxed with it and it'll go off, it'll be dumped off onto other people. So you, you already see in just, you know, the, the beginning stages of her plan, the gaming of the system that people will actually do and how that, how it is going to actually tax employees. Because if you look at the capital gains cut, why is the economy so good right now? People have the ability to hire because they have more capital. So unemployment is low. If you add another hundreds of thousands of dollars, several percentage points of taxes, you raise basically, I think I, I read that it was going to be 37%. Capital gains right now is 25%. It's going to go up to 37% under this plan. You will have effectively cut off all foreign investment in the United States. You will have people fired across the board for a myriad of reasons, but mainly they can't afford it. And in the head tax, it, let's say you have 20 employees and every person cost you $30,000 to the government. Mm -hmm. Well, the lowest in the low, the, what they're going to do is they're just going to say, well, we need to shed jobs. So we're going to fire the lowest income employees first mm -hmm. to save that $30,000 head tax a year. 
And so what you're going to do is the very people that you are trying to craft a plan for, you're going to hurt because you're going to get those people fired first, much like the minimum wage proposals that we often see. So, you know, it, it will end up being not just a tax on the middle classes, but the lowest classes, the lowest income classes specifically, which in turn only increases drug sales and the opioid problem. When people are out of work, things are not and good. Jail populations go Absolutely. up because people will go steal. And, and this was all figured out back with um, HR 25, the, uh, the fair tax, right? So they figured out that everything that we buy right now, every product, every service, uh, because of the payroll taxes and the, and the corporate taxes and all the taxes that are on businesses and everything else, they're passing that on down to this, to, through the chain of all the different hops that go through there. And it ends up the consumer paying 30%. 30% of everything you pay right now is a tax that you don't see. It's a hidden tax. Same thing is going to happen here. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and it's going to, oh, sorry. I was going to also drive to get, companies to just stop hiring you're just going to have a big major corporation where the core group is going to work for the, the actual corporation and many many temps oh yeah many there's going to be a lot of contracting going on mm -hmm. yep and and yeah it, it, it's going to it's so no middle class tax increases the 11 trillion in household expenses back in the pockets of american families that's substantially larger than the largest tax cut in american history but so what they're claiming is that $11 trillion in medical savings will be saved, but you're going to pay. It, it effectively turns out that it's about $326,000 per American it, it, for this plan. If you don't think that you're going to suffer some consequences, you just can't slow the economy growth. You can't decrease the economy by 10 to 20% and not expect it to affect every American. It's insane. Well, you can't tax the middle class if you destroy the middle class because exactly. there's no middle class jobs. Right. Uh, so let's go on to the cost of Medicare for all. Uh, now, she's asked the top experts to consider the long-term cost of her plan to implement Medicare for all over 10 years. Donald Berwick, one of the nation's top experts in the healthcare system improvement who ran the Medicare and Medicaid programs under Obama, and Simon Johnson, the former chief economist at the IMF and a professor at MIT, uh, their analysis begins with the assumption of a recent study by the Urban Institute and then examines how the cost estimate would change as certain new key policy choices are applied. These experts conclude that her plan would, significant, would slightly reduce the projected amount of money that the U.S. would otherwise spend on healthcare over the next 10 years while covering everyone and giving them the vastly better coverage. So, she wants to reduce insurer administrative costs. This is, I think, the most unironically funny part of this. Uh, she wants to reduce insurer administrative costs by basically putting them out of business. Um, incredibly, insurance companies spend a whopping $350 billion on administration costs annually, and then in turn push huge additional administration costs onto hospitals, doctors, and millions of other healthcare professionals in the form of complex billing and then in turn drive up costs incurred by employers as they attempt to navigate the complexity of providing their employees with insurance. So Elizabeth Warren is mad at health care companies and employers and insurance companies for spending so much on administrative costs. Mm -hmm. Would anyone want to venture a guess why they spend so much damn time on administrative costs? I'm going to assume because they're greedy capitalists, right? And the only way they can take more money from their customers is to make paperwork. You're right. This episode is going to be bad for people who can't a, get sarcasm. Yeah. It's a jobs program, right? <laughs> for intersectional gender non-binary people. Uh, so, no, the, the reason they spend so much damn money is compliance because of government regulation. What's that word, HIPAA? Have anybody ever heard of that? I love HIPAA. HIPAA's uh, great. HIPAA. Yeah. How many times have I signed a HIPAA form in the past two? Years? I've been going. I've been going to a lot of uh, a lot of doctors' offices over the past seven years mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of paperwork that we have to fill out, and mm -hmm. it gets a little annoying. Yep. 
And it's just boomers that make this, you know. Well, and the worst part is, is that all your records are supposed to be digital now. So they should have digital copies of all that stuff already. Yeah. Yeah, in, but in, my, they, in my record that should be passed around to all the different doctors, I shouldn't have to fill out a packet of paper every time I go to see no, a no, no, bro. But, Google, but, 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 Google's been secretly collecting that. It's, it's on its way. It just call, Brian, call the CIA and let them How would you want them to transfer that information? It. Because a lot of those people would probably try to fax it. <laughs> How can you fax a, a, a stick, right? A USB stick. Oh, let's, uh, they'll try. <laughs> you, you know you've seen people try. Ooh, it's not, I'm going to fax you the hard drive. Where do I stick it? Oh, man. Oh, man. It, it's, it's just amazing. Because like I said, I've, I've spent a lot of time in the healthcare uh, industry over the past seven years. And it's fun. Uh, the, the, the fun thing is, is, though, I mean, the doctors have been wonderful and great. The but they even are exasperated. You can tell when they have to do, oh, we got this paperwork. We can't give you this medicine because I, I had a doctor with my wife's issues that was, she's having to fight the insurance company because she prescribed this, like these two or three drugs. And they're like, well, we, we won't cover those three together. We you only have two or one and, and, and they're fighting over it. And she's like, I'm the doctor. I'm the one determining this. Right. And then they can't give her pain medicine after she lost part of her foot because, well, the opioid crisis and the government says we can't do that now. Right. But the government is determining whether or not the doctor, and, and I, we said this before, when the whole Obamacare thing came around, and I said this back when Hillary Clinton was trying to do the same thing back in the 90s, that as soon as you let the government involved into the medical industry, they're going to try to make decisions for you. And I don't want the government, which is in effect everybody else who doesn't know anything about me in my life telling me how to handle my health care right that should be my decision with my doctor everybody else can just screw off yikes sorry no 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 a little rant I, was, I was i was yikesing something else uh, <laughs> just reinhold yeah yeah uh, Medicare for all will save money by bringing down the staggering administrative costs for insurers in our current system by destroying the companies. As the experts I asked to evaluate my plan noted, private insurers had an administrative cost of 12% premiums collected in 2017, and while Medicare kept its administrative cost down to 2.3%. My plan will ensure that Medicare for all functions just as efficiently as traditional Medicare by setting net administrative spending at 2.3%. So, uh, next, comprehensive payment reform. Under my approach, Medicare for All will, simple, will sharply reduce administrative spending and reimburse physicians and other non-hospital providers at current Medicare rates. Now, does anybody who's ever interacted with any government agency within the sound of my voice truly believe that a government-run program, a bureaucracy that will control 20% of our economy, will sharply reduce administrative spending and reimburse physicians and other non-hospital providers in a timely manner. Anyone. If anybody also, could let me show add, me the proof of that actually ever happening. And the only time... The, the number one cause of crime in Florida is Medicare fraud, by the way. Oh, and, and you always get pointed to this, too, on the, the people on the left say, well, look, look at the low cost of Medicare, uh, the low administrative cost of Medicare. It's lower than regular insurance. Like, yeah, because you're fudging the numbers because it's the government program because they're borrowing money. They don't have to, you know, and they're using force that you, of, of course you can manipulate and say whatever you want. But when you look at what really happens is the people who are getting screwed too much by Medicare, they just quit taking Medicare. Right. Yeah. They're going to be doing it under the table. We're going to have just like we have with the drug war and prohibition and everything else is when you live in it, you try to, uh, to over-regulate something, it's just going to go a black market, and good luck. Yeah. So her plan will also rebalance rates in a budget-neutral way that increase reimbursements for primary care providers and lower reimbursements for overpaid specialties. So she's, let me rephrase that in a non-reedy way. She's going to rebalance rates that increase reimbursements for primary care providers, but lower reimbursements for quote unquote overpaid specialties so aka if you uh, want to take that extra two or three years of college and spend that extra money 
to try and become a person that makes two to three million dollars because you're an anesthesiologist, the most deadly and dangerous uh, position in medical care or a heart surgeon, uh, she's going to make sure you don't get paid as much. So what incentive would those people have who, uh, why not just become a lawyer? (laughs) Why deal with all this bullshit? Why would anybody who wants to become a doctor deal with any of this become a politician that's where the money's at right well private in yeah she's the richest candidate in the race other than donald trump she's worth 12 million dollars by the way she's talking about herself when she talks about the one percent so while private insurance companies pay higher tax i mean higher rates this system would be expected to continue compensating providers at roughly the same overall rate they are currently receiving why this is partially because providers will now get paid medicare rates for their medicaid patients a substantial raise, but it's also because providers spend an enormous amount of time on billing and interacting with insurance companies that reduces their efficiency and takes away from time with patients. So all of this assumes that somehow the government plan, the government operated system will be more efficient than what we have now, which is inefficient because of government. (laughs) Yeah. The Nonpartisan Institute of Medicine estimates that these wasted expenses account for th- I agree there are wasted expenses. Let's just end all this regulatory bullshit in medicine. Account for 13% of the revenue for physician practices. So 13% of your doctor's total revenue goes towards compliance with the, what she's accidentally telling. 8.5% for hospitals and 10% for other providers. So you're telling me costs could be 10% lower? if we just got rid of all of the unnecessary bullshit that they have to go through. Together, the improved efficiency will save doctors time and money, helping significantly offset revenue they will lose from getting rid of higher private insurance rates. My approach, Medicare for All, will sharply reduce administrative spending and members hospitals at an average of 110% of current Medicare rates. So if you've been with the government the whole time, we're gonna bonus you for being uh, good boys and girls. With an appropriate adjustment for rural hospitals, teaching hospitals, and other healthcare providers with challenging cost structures. Pretty soon you're going to see uh, Methodist at uh, 16th and Post turn into a rural hospital. There's a food desert around us. Help. Uh, until 2017, <laughs> hospitals that treated Medicare patients were paid about 9.9% less than what it costs to care for that patient. The increase I am proposing under Medicare for All will cover hospitals' current costs of care but hospital costs will also substantially decrease as a result of simpler administrative processes, lower prescription drug prices, <laughs> and the end of bad debt from uncompensated care. Oh, she's going to just cancel off the debt, I think she's saying, uh, and more patients with insurance seeking care. In my plan for rural America, for example, I have committed to creating a new designation under Medicare. I'm just going to kind of skip past this part because it's I don't want to get too dry here, but... Uh, it's kind of all the same stuff. You can read more of that in the notes. Um, restoring healthcare competition is uh, also exceedingly funny. Uh, so, <laughs> under Medicare for All, hospitals won't be able to force some patients to pay more because the hospital can't agree with their insurance company. Instead, because everyone has good insurance, <laughs> providers will have to compete on better care. And reduced wait times in order to attract more patients. Here's the problem. You can't have a market. If you have a, if you have a market-based system, you have less wait times because there's more options and there's more incentive for providers to get into the business. And so you have less lines, less queues. When you have no markets, you have longer lines. It's just, it's basic economics of supply and demand. And so the idea that she is telling you that we're going to increase competition and get lower wait times by reducing the market to zero and only having one provider pay for all of this stuff is just economically nonsense. She either is lying, which is certainly possible considering who she is as a human being, Mm -hmm. or she is just completely unaware unaware of economics, which also may be. She may just be so prideful that she thinks that she can will this into existence. Um, There are economic, there there are economists like um, uh, Robert Reich, for example, who base their economics on what they wish were the case, not observed reality. 
Yes. And that becomes the problem. Right. So they, they come up with these formulas and everything else, but it doesn't contort with what humans actually do. It, it eliminates the human element in all of this. Because when you open it up and say, okay, you can go to the doctor anytime you want, you get a sniffle. You're going to the doctor to make sure it's not anything. It's not Legionnaire's disease. You know, you got a little bit of the flu, right? So right, right now, it because it costs to go do stuff, People will say, well, do I really think this is a thing that I need to go to the doctor for or not? And they'll hold back. Therefore, they can handle the load. You start giving everybody the green light to just head to the doctor anytime they want. It's not going to make lines any less long. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because resources are scarce and they have other uses. So if you make it all free, then you, you, know, you, you take and, away everything. And meanwhile, and meanwhile, you know that the doctors are going to be so well compensated and the nurses and the and and all these people in the in the industry are just going to get so much money that they're going to be a flood of new people wanting those jobs. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. That's that's what I want to do. Do it the general public. Um yeah. Go ahead. Oh, and the other thing is just like but because it, it ignores a lot of the rational things that what most people actually need in healthcare. You, most people don't need a doctor. We just need to let nurses do what they do best and free them right. up. You know, so we had the, we've had such an increase in the nurse practitioner mm -hmm. uh, kind of sub level of do like the doctor. Then they have the nurse practitioners and the nurses. So the nurse practitioners can do some of the work that the doctor does. And if you don't need, you know, something sp very specific, you know, mm -hmm. very necessary to have a doctor look at, let the nurse practitioner take care of it. It costs a lot less. Everybody saves money. And you go mm -hmm. home happy. Right. Oh, we carried a job for the nurse, you know, and if we keep, if we able to bring it down to a lot of things to a nurse's level, mm -hmm. we can Walmart the dang thing. Walmart can have a nurse sitting there in line. You can sit there and check out. Well, you can go sure. now and get flu shots, right? Or and do right. There's lots of things. You can go to a Walgreens or a CVS and get mm -hmm. taken care of now. Mm -hmm. So what's, what's, what's wrong with that market providing what we have, what we yeah. need? Yeah. I can't wait until I go up to the store. They're offering the flu shots in the line as you wait to check out be great it'd be awesome you when know? you wait to self-checkout right yeah yeah self-check <laughs> that's a better use of that cashier's <laughs> time to get my get enjoy your vaccination <laughs> oh you're yeah, mandatory there will be people control. with uh, guns <laughs> making sure you do that all right so i i just tried to to google this murray rothbard quote but uh i i couldn't find it because i don't think i'm i don't think he said gangsters but basically murray rothbard talks about how the uh, the government is basically two cartels fighting over control of your life and they're all gangsters and you shouldn't trust any of them, um, which uh, is just so true. And this is why this is the most gangster shit entire thing until we get to the tax part. Uh, so we just said, basically, she says hospitals won't be able to force. Force is wrong as long as she's not the one doling it out. Uh, patients to pay more because of disputes. Um, everyone will have good insurance. Providers will have to compete on better care and reduce times. So think about this. She's basically arguing that, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got St. Francis near me, Community South, Community East, Methodist, and IU. Um, I've got about five hospitals around me right now. I couldn't tell you who's the best in terms of wait times. I couldn't tell you who's the best in terms of care. I couldn't tell you. Like most of us are not that informed about that kind of stuff. But she's just assuming that you will be a better consumer once you get onto government. So the competition in her mind, she's restoring competition because these evil hospitals and insurance companies can't play games with you. And so the my insurance is the same at any one of these five hospitals right my medicare insurance is going to be the same in any one of these five hospitals so the idea that there would be competition between those five hospitals does not make it a market this is like when barack obama gave us seven choices in the ACA and said it's competition when george bush limited drug pricing comp competition and called it a free market solution. Like it's not the free market. It's not a market solution at all. She isn't creating any competition whatsoever. She's in fact deleting competition because there's only a monopoly on, on care here. And in reality, one or several of those five hospitals are going to go out of business or be completely short staffed because no one will actually become 
but she will make sure providers will have to compete on better care and reduce wait times. It's mandatory that you have shorter wait times, even though we've created the scenario. See, we've created the game and then we're mad at how you play the rules. And so we can blame you. Really what you get out of government and politicians like Elizabeth Warren is they're an abuse of X. They gaslight you. They create the games and the rules. And then when you don't follow through in the way that they like, they blame you for being the problem. Hmm. Um, so then she says, that's why I will appoint aggressive antitrust enforcers, enforcers, the woman says, to the Department of Justice and Federal Trade Commission and allow hospitals to voluntarily divest. Okay. She's going to hire aggressive enforcers to allow hospitals to voluntarily divest holdings to restore competition to hospital markets. All right. This, this is, is so stupid. I mean, it's, that phrase is so stupid. I, my brain hurts for reading it. It has force and voluntary and compliance all with it and, and free market competition all with What? Wonder, like, I feel, force. I feel, I, I, I feel crazy. Like, I feel gaslit. Um, <laughs> she's every bit as much the authoritarian as Donald Trump is. Like, I don't care what anybody says. Yeah, uh, see, man, that plan for your libertarianism, we're just going to do right. it by force. Right. <laughs> That's why I will appoint aggressive antitrust forces to the Department of Justice and Federal Trade Commission and allow hospitals to allow hospitals to voluntarily divest holdings to restore competition to hospital markets. I've also previously committed to strengthening FTC oversight over healthcare organizations, including nonprofit hospitals, to crack down on anti-competitive behavior. And I will direct my FTC to block all future hospital mergers unless the merging companies can prove, to whom, her, that the newly merged entity will maintain or improve care. So she's deciding what is anti-competitive behavior, and she is deciding what is a uh, quality of care. She is making the decision on who can what their property. If you grew a healthcare business and want to merge with somebody else, it's up to her whether or not you did a good enough job and whether this makes sense for her wishes. This is the most authoritarian paragraph that I have read since reading 1984. I mean, it, this is insane. Uh, so she, she, she truly believes that she has all the right answers, that she is going to take this plan to Congress. They're going to go, great idea. You know, uh, all those lobbyists and healthcare industry workers that they had to hire because you people will not stop regulating us, uh, I'm sure they'll just rubber stamp all this and you'll get to single-handedly create a healthcare system to the way that you think operates best. Just like the uh, Consumer Protection Bureau, which I'll put in the show notes our episode on that, Harry. If you remember that episode, uh, which was a couple of years ago almost at this point, the Consumer Protection Bureau basically turned into a liberal slush fund where Elizabeth Warren's hand-selected cronies were cracking down on conservative-leaning bankers and and hedge fund managers and it was basically a corrupt organization that she had instituted in the obama administration and it was just a complete joke it didn't protect consumers it didn't con protect you and me it protected her and her friends from the opposite side of the aisle politically uh, now, hilariously, Mick Mulvaney is in charge of it still. <laughs> yeah, and this is what, it, what she's trying to also do to medical. The whole idea, like, if the you know World Health Organization deems your medication that you created as you know essential and you, there's not enough of it, we will deem that we can now make a generic of it. Thank you for your patent. Oh, yeah, here's the no, other no, no. thing too. They completely, Harry. At one point during this, she says, "Your patent is worthless if I decide so." Yeah. Yeah. So here's the best part about all of this. Which I'm down for because patents are stupid. We keep going, right? All right uh, no, no, you're fine. You uh, but the worst part about all this is that you don't – they haven't learned a thing from the election of Donald Trump. Because no. here, here we have – and maybe not in the way you think that most people would say that phrase, but 
if you're going to put the government in charge of something, especially something this involatile in your life and making decisions for you and determining this and setting rules on that, that only works if that person is you and you're wholly wonderful and you're the angel that uh, you think you are. What happens when Donald Trump gets in office, somebody you despise who doesn't respect all of that and decides to change it or, or run it in a corrupt way or, or, some other Democrat gets in and changes it or, you know, there's, there's never, you're never going to be in a position where someone terrible cannot get into government because that's kind of the way the government works and the way politics works. So all you're doing is taking a, a, pro a program that has some issues and we like to fix and giving it to the people who are the least capable and most corrupt to run it. It doesn't make any sense to me. George Bush yeah. built PRISM and the spying apparatus and then handed it over to the Obama administration who probably used yeah. it to help spy on the Trump campaign. And then the Trump campaign, I'm sure at some point we will find out the Trump administration used the NSA and the, it, its spying apparatus. Well, they well, probably can't Obama, because those people hate yeah. those people. But. Yeah, we know Obama was using the IRS to go after right. political opponents. So... It, 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 you, the bigger you build the government, the more tools you're giving to the person that hates you. Yeah. So, yeah, this, it, it's like as crazy as they went over his election and was just mind gobbed, just freaked out about it. I was just waiting for that aha moment where they would say, maybe we shouldn't give the president or we shouldn't give government this much power because then one really corrupt individual could just screw us all. The Democrats and have gone the opposite. Way. They, want to in, they want to massively increase. I mean, Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren are begging for more executive power, basically exactly. saying, fuck you. I'm going to do with the office whatever I want. Way more than Barack Obama ever did. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't make any sense to me. Like, like where, where's this moment of enlightenment going to come? I'm just, I was just waiting for it. It never, never happened. Well, Brian Hull, the president, is like the, company, the country's dad. You've got to listen to dad. Right. Yeah, especially when dad's beating mom and drinking too much, right? <laughs> now, beating uh, mom, you mean the Statue of Liberty? Oh! <laughs> so I, I had a, a couple more pages that I wanted to do tonight, but I, I think we're kind of... We, let's. I think it's a good we're stop. We're sarcasmed out a little bit. <laughs> yeah. We got 17 more pages to do next week. Uh, so this may be a three-parter, my goodness. <laughs> Uh, he did such a good job of the notes, but uh, man. Um, so yeah, that is the beginning. That is part one. There will be a part two, maybe a part three on this. I just think it's so rich and deep that the, the, the benefit of the Warren campaign is that she is actually putting to paper so much of this uh, liberal thought that has been floating around for the last 10 years, and we get the ability to analyze it. So uh, if you see anything on there about Medicare for All, send it our way, editor at We Are Libertarians. Uh, any final thoughts, Harry? One, it is, remember the last time the government decided to touch um, anything really at all? I was just going to say my heart, med med medical, uh, but everything the government touches is usually junk. And I'm proud of Elizabeth Warren for not trying to you know, she fudged some of the num may have fudged some of the numbers, but we are talking about speculative numbers of, of a system of, of gigantic piece of the economy that had no no one really has any grasp of what it is because it's a gigantic marketplace. So the idea that you can even think you can manipulate it with, you know, some magic wand or handle, it's I'm impressed just of some actually put pen to paper and said that this is if I was going to do it, this is how we do it. Right. I'm impressed. Because the one thing you, it's always hard to argue with any of those, or like most, you know, quote unquote progressives, is they won't put their, you know, they won't put their ideas on paper and say, "Well, that's not mine. That's not mine. I'm not that." Well, here you go. Thank you. Thank you. This is all I wanted. Tell me how you were going to do for this. Cool. Now I can debate this. I can tell you how this is wrong and this is going to work. Thank you. So, and that's what. It, that's why it's so hard to debate them. That's why, you, like anyone you ever feel like it's hard to debate them. Stop debating them and then just try to get specifics of what they're trying to debate. Put it down on paper. Yeah. yeah. Ryan Holt? Yeah, I just, like I said before, I've spent a lot of time in the medical industry as a consumer for the past seven years. And 
it is clear that some of these people just don't really understand what is going on and what the issues are. Um, they, they want to make political points. They want to score in some way, but they don't want to take the time to actually go out and learn and listen and find out what the real problems are. So uh, it just gets to the point of why, you know, why are we listening to these people trying to do any of this stuff and why would we give them the power to do it? Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. Um, and just before I kick it over, uh, I want to make sure to remind everybody to get on the discord uh, where Harry and I kind of spend a lot of time hanging out and um thanks for the warning <laughs> and you want to follow me on facebook it's reinhold on facebook reinhold on twitter and reinhold plays on twitter on twitch i'm doing actual plugs all right. i haven't done that in a year <laughs> uh all right yeah please join the facebook group too uh, it's all right there at we are libertarians.com uh thanks everybody for watching we will continue with part two next week harry will be out of town Fear not, he will be back. Uh, maybe Reinhold, you can come back next Tuesday. We'll do another yep. Zoom. Maybe I can rope sure. in this and uh, do that. So we will That'll see. Be great. You. We will see you next week. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>